Good morning and welcome back. It's been, I believe, two weeks already since we did not have a class, but we had a midterm exam. I did not have time to read your exam papers, but I hope to have time today in the afternoon during my flight to The Hague uh, via Munich. So uh, I usually read exam papers during my flights in order to you know, use time more efficiently. Um, and people sitting right next to me are amazed with the grades that I'm giving. Well, some of them say, well, 90. <laughs> so high. Well, I say he or she deserves. So uh, you don't have to be afraid if you did not have a good exam. Some, some, some of you sent a couple of messages uh, saying that your exam performance uh, was below your expectations. Actually, I don't think I ask anything unexpected, but if there's anything I mean, if your performance was below uh, the level that you expected, well, I think uh, you should revise uh, the method that you're studying for this course. But um, we will have another exam, the final exam. There will be OPED and the simulation, as well as your attendance, class participation. So there's nothing to press the panic button. I'll tell you if you have to press the uh, panic button. So. Um, I believe there are two or three students who missed the exam. Are they here? Not even today? OK, fine. That's, uh, I was going to announce, yes, you're one of them. All right, somebody has to warn you that professor is speaking about something that interests you, right? So give your full attention to what I'm saying here, all right? In order not to miss other things. Uh, I, I believe this uh, attendance paper is being circulated. Uh, please mark your names and signatures. All right, um, I think I will have to wait another while for announcing the date of the exam, the makeup exam, because I have to have everybody here, all three of you. And also I have to consult this with my assistant because she's going to give you the exam and I don't know much about her schedule. And most probably it will be sometime in the later afternoon, like 4.30 or something, or maybe 3.30, depending on your schedules. And the exam will be uh, something that you will have to study for that exam, right? So just don't take things uh, easy. Um, the second announcement, as you know, time is approaching for due dates, deadlines, like op-eds. Um, you must have something like about a month to go. A month is much more than necessary for uh, writing an op-ed. As I said, for those who know uh, who, uh, what he or she is going to write, even a couple of days is more than uh, necessary. So if you concentrate on what you have to uh, think about and write about, uh, it's, it's not going to be a big deal. And if you are not clear about what an op-ed is and how it should look like, please don't come to me again because I, I, I you know, explained this many times in my office during this progress report times as well as on some individual discussions, on one-on-one -on -one discussions, as well as I spent at least an hour, a full hour on the op-ed thing and just go to the video.pilkent.edu.tr and find the podcast, one of the uh, podcast uh, recordings uh, at the beginning of the semester, the second, the third, or whatever. I, I, I don't remember exactly one. And watch that video, all right? So uh, you, you have there everything you need uh, about the op -eds. So, but as a final note about the op -ed, it is something that has to be analytical, that something that you argue something, defend an idea, a position, and of course uh, you substantiate your position, your argument with some facts, figures that might be available. It is not something that true from the top of your head, but something that not at all also uh, either it's uh, anything like, well, that part says this or the other part says that. I don't want this kind of uh, just mere descriptive uh, discussion. I want you to have an opinion, a position vis-a-vis -vis something, and also substantiate it or sort of support it, endorse it with some 
uh, other arguments, facts, figures, or thoughts, views, whatever. All right? Just think about it. Uh, with respect to simulation, I believe you had your uh, meetings scheduled at least with the embassies. And don't forget, as I said at least several times, embassy meetings are not actually the only thing. I mean, you have to carry out extensive research about the formal positions of the countries that you are going to represent. So therefore, you have to consult with as many people as possible and also uh, consult with just many sources that you can find on the internet or other places. All right? Just think about these things because we are going now toward the end of the semester. We have uh, passed already the uh, sort of halfway and we're going to towards the termination of the semester in, in about a month from today. Um, you still have the screen. Of course, I will advance several screens, several slides. We are not going to take from the beginning, but I just want to say something just to see the whole picture here. The Iran's uh, Iran's ambitions and emerging crisis. We talked about the background. We sort of uh, set out the puzzle. What is the what is the issue which creates a problem among nations? What is the problematic issue? And we were studying the position of the actors in the puzzle. Well, um, as you will remember, this actually is something that comes from November 2006. It's not an updated version. I actually did not update this on purpose because in some places, I mean, as we go, as we advance, you will see some uh, uh, differences between the past positions of some countries, especially uh, European Union and partially Russia. And uh, back in the 2006 and seven these years, and also today. And this is something that can tell us that there, there might be further changes in their position. So in foreign policy, nothing is static. Foreign policy is a dynamic process. And the task of the foreign policy makers is to watch this screen, look at the screen at all times, and the radar screen and take positions and if necessary change positions vis-a-vis -vis the emerging sort of risks as well as uh, chances or opportunities that, that may arise. So therefore uh, we will see here rather clearly that especially there has been a significant change in the position of the European Union. So we'll advance with this and if there is anything that you cannot remember or you want to refresh your minds with respect to the past slides, just as I will go rather quickly, uh, please raise your hand and ask questions about these slides and about this information. So we talked about the past uh, or the history of Iran's nuclear ambitions uh, starting from the uh, Shah period as early as the 50s and 60s, but more so after the uh, OPEC crisis uh, when Iran actually confronted with large sums of money. Then, of course, we stated the, uh, the puzzle. Why is it that you know, some of the activities which Iran claims to be totally legal and legitimate are found to be uh, illegitimate or illegal or as part of uh, uh, a sort of uh, something that violates Iran's uh, treaty obligations according to some other party. We, we stated here the reasons why. Uh, maybe we can just uh, start, uh, just to refresh minds, uh, uh, starting from here. Um, as we know now very well, that because Iran is a state party to the MPT, the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, which was signed in 1968 and entered into force in 1970, and it was signed and ratified by Iran uh, in 1968 and 69. So Iran is a state party to the treaty, uh, the MPT. And Iran is a state party. A state party means a state which is signed and ratified. Just to remind you and just to refresh your minds, government's or 
whatever administrations may, may exist in, in countries because there are 200 countries, states, nations in the world and they, they may have different uh, administrative uh, structures and usually international treaties, conventions, documents are signed by the governments and signing a document is an indication of the intention to comply with the terms of the treaty or uh, convention, whatever it is, whatever the document might, might be. And it has to be ratified by the upper house. In some countries, this upper house is a senate. In some other countries, the upper house is a parliament. In some others, there might be a council of, I don't know, wise men or something, or the emperor or the uh, monarch. I don't know. So therefore, uh, when a state, when a state actually, uh, when a state signs as well as ratifies a treaty, then it becomes a state party. State party means it has, it is now bound by the terms of the treaty. Just by signing a treaty, a country does not become bound or does not, or is not obliged to comply with the terms of the treaty. After ratification, this is an obligation for the state. And this obligation remains as long as that state is in the treaty or as a part of the convention or whatever. And in the case of the MPT, you might remember from our past discussions, uh, since 1970, in five-year intervals and so on, the MPT uh, was reviewed. And in 1995, there was a review an extension conference. Therefore, the, the conference after 1990 review, review conference, it was reviewed and also extended, and the extension was indefinite and unconditional. So, actually, that means there is no condition attached to the extension of the MPT. And because its extension was indefinite, so there is no deadline for, or there is no expiration date for the MPT. So, so long as, or as, as long as we can foresee, actually, in the future, into the future, the MPT will remain with us, unless there, are, there is something uh, unusual that happens and all of a sudden, some, uh, a number of countries uh, deposit their uh, desire or express their desire to withdraw from the treaty because there is such a possibility under some extreme conditions and if a country decides that staying in the treaty is something that runs counter to its vital interest by you know, making an early notification uh, for some time, then that country may withdraw from the treaty. For instance, North Korea uh, was late to come uh, or become a state party and then after some developments, it was forced in, in a sense by Russia and China to uh, first sign and ratify the treaty. Ratification came a little bit late, but during the um, uh, second Gulf crisis, I mean 2002, uh, North Korea withdrew from the MPT. Now it is outside of the N MPT. And therefore, whatever North Korea is doing these days cannot be found uh, guilty just uh, within the context of the MPT because they are not at all and anymore bound by the MPT. Any country can do that. But of course, uh, now one of the issues that, is, uh, uh, that are being discussed in the international uh, security uh, community is whether we should make it difficult for countries to withdraw from the treaty, whether it, is, it should be easy or you know, straightforward uh, for countries to uh, withdraw from the treaty because by withdrawal, I mean, you just get rid of all your obligations. I mean, one might ask, of course, uh, as the first question that comes to one's mind, why, what is wrong with that? I mean, if a country doesn't want to stay in a treaty, it is its sovereign right to withdraw from the treaty, fine. But by entering into, by becoming a member of the treaty, you entertain certain privileges. You acquire some rights you just uh, some, you, you get some capabilities. Then you advance your level thanks to being in the, in the treaty and then by exploiting this uh, privileges actually to the extent possible, then one day you say, well, you know what, I'm off with the treaty. I don't want to stay anymore. 
now I'm withdrawing. So there is this fear of developing what is called breakout capabilities. A breakout cap capability is such a capability that uh, gives one, a country, the ability, the capability to develop nuclear weapons or come closer to developing nuclear weapons after having uh, uh, sort of, uh, in a sense, abused, of course, uh, the rights by staying within the MPT. So therefore, this is an issue which uh, has to be also kept in mind. I mean, this is not that simple. You can just say, well, that country was, uh, uh, or used its sovereign rights to sign the treaty, ratify the treaty, now it is using the same right to withdraw from the treaty. It is not that simple. And therefore, if a country declares its intention to withdraw from the treaty, every other country or all other, other countries will be concerned about what is the reason for this country to withdraw from the treaty. Did, did that, this country develop breakout capabilities? And is it going to develop nuclear weapons soon? Which is not, of course, something desired by the rest of the international community. Anyway, so. Going back to this point, Iran signed, ratified the treaty during the Shah period. And of course, after uh, about 10 years later, uh, there was a revolution, uh, the Islamic revolution in Iran. Things have changed. The entire uh, sort of uh, ideology has changed. The state structure, to a great extent, has changed. And of course, the regime has changed, and, and the foreign policy priorities have been affected from this. I, I cannot say uh, entirely changed, but because there are other factors that affect a country's foreign policy. And what I see, I mean, personal, this is my personal comment. You may agree or disagree, or some other people might agree or disagree, but what I see is pretty much this continuation of the previous policy of becoming a nuclear power. So what was the ambition uh, back in the Shah period uh, to become uh, a nuclear power, a nuclear capable state, uh, actually something that continues in, in, in the Islamic regime. So with respect to the uh, clerical sort of uh, administration or the, the Mullah regime. So therefore, uh, Iran is, is a state party to the MPT. And according to the MPT, it sort of provided that Iran never diverts its capabilities from peaceful to military purposes, it can develop uh, indigenously by itself or by way of transfers or by, by, by way of uh, sort of a bilateral, multilateral agreements with other countries. It may import capabilities, transfer uh, nuclear technology from other countries so, so long as they all remain uh, under sort of a peaceful purposes. So this is the essence of the question. Because according to uh, the United States, Western powers, most of the rest of the world, actually, Iran's desires, actually, um, according to a group of countries, Iran's desire is not a peaceful one. And there are certain indications, according to this uh, uh, people's view, that Iran's intentions actually not clear and most probably uh, has military uh, intentions or just has the intention to divert uh, peaceful applications or peaceful capabilities to military capabilities. So, um, and one indication of this actually is not reporting the construction of a very significant facility, which is enrichment facility, uh, which was built since 1984 until 2002. Uh, by the Chinese actually help to a great extent. Uh, and during these 18 years, Iran did not uh, report this uh, facility to the IAEA, which is something that it had to do. I mean, uh, there is no explanation for this. And this is an indication of its sort of uh, unclear intentions, let's say, at the least. So um, This is at the crux of the matter. It's, the, it's part of the puzzle, let's say. And there are countries, I mean, there are different countries uh, who have different views with respect to Iran's capabilities. From the US perspective, 
actually Iran's capability, I mean, United States sees Iran's nuclear capabilities. No matter how developed they are, or whether they have built a nuclear weapon or not, well, to our knowledge, there is no sign of nuclear weapons built by Iran. Of course, we cannot know the entire truth. But, I mean, I think we would have known by now if Iran had developed already. But uh, and most likely, Iran does not have nuclear weapons capability for the time being. But, you know, the United States sees Iran's uh, capability as a threat and wants Iran to permanently halt uranium enrichment. Because just remember, nuclear weapons need uh, either highly enriched uranium, HEU, or plutonium. And I'm not going to go into technical details again. And for uh, HEU, you have to have enrichment facilities. You have to enrich the percentage of 235 isotope, you know, uranium 235 isotope, from its 0.7% uh, proportion in the natural uranium to 90 plus percentage. So, therefore, uh, you need enrichment capabilities, and Iran, as I just mentioned, in Natanz area, has uh, built a large enrichment facility, which has the capability or capacity to install 55,000 55, uh, centrifuges. I mean, centrifuges are used as just one of the techniques to enrich uranium. There are other techniques, but Iran has seemingly uh, adopted this uh, technology. And with 55,000 centrifuges, you can enrich up to 3.5% for one power reactor per year. So for Bush Air, for instance, which is not very large, but a large uh, power reactor, which has just started operation this autumn, uh, it's scheduled for August. I, I believe there, was, there were some technical difficulties. And since uh, September, early October, they have started you know, uh, uh, generating electricity at small amounts. And f with 55,000 centrifuges, uh, you can use this facility for and, and run this facility for one year in order to supply enough low enrich uranium for one power reactor. Amelia? Um, I was just wondering, like, uh, what's the procedure for the IAEA to uh, search for, to do nuclear inspections? Well, um, let me just. Uh, talk about this briefly because we covered this issue a little bit extensively, but the IAEA, I mean, once a state becomes a member of the MPT, not only by signing, as I said, by becoming a state party, I mean, after ratification, that state, state party must conclude with the IAEA um, an agreement based on the a safeguards agreement what is called safeguards agreement based on model protocol which is also in the language of the International Atomic Energy Agency it's information circular 153 this is a well tiny blue book there are some 116 or 114 paragraphs, articles. And it is a model protocol which is applied to almost every country, every non-nuclear weapon state. And any non-nuclear weapon state, once signed and ratified the treaty, within six months, must sit with the IAEA and discuss the terms of the safeguards agreement as to how inspections will be carried out in that particular country. And this, there is this model protocol according to which this safeguard agreement is decided or just signed. So this is something that comes from 1970, 71. And back in 1970, because of the conjunctural developments, because of the position of Japan and Germany, 
which I discuss here again extensively, but because they did not want to be negatively affected from the uh, sort of intrusive or from the frequent inspections, because during the inspections, you have to shut down the reactor. And during these days, uh, I mean, you cannot run or generate electricity, you cannot run the reactor, or what, you cannot do whatever you want to do. And if a country has a number of reactors, and if that country's reactors are being inspected frequently, and, and if you bear in mind that a nuclear reactor normally operates less than 200 days a, a year, and if there are 10, 15 or so, or maybe 20 days just passed with these inspections, of course, they, this is, uh, it, it creates some sort of a commercial disadvantage. So Japan and Germany, which had a number, large number of reactors and large power reactors in which inspections would last longer than other sort of reactors or other facilities, so they put some restrictions or actually they uh, created an environment uh, by, uh, whereby in 1970-71 the model protocol did not come out as a very powerful document. So according to model protocol, um, uh, of the uh, safeguards agreement, assume this is a country. Assume there are these nuclear facilities. The IAEA can go only to the declared nuclear facility. If a country has declared all these facilities but not this one, the IAEA, even if it knows that there is a, another facility here, cannot go to that sort of facility according to the model protocol. Well, hopefully, after the 1990s, there were some developments, the Iraq war, South African revelations about its uh, nuclear capabilities that they built, nuclear weapons, six of them, the seventh was underway, etc., etc. There is now additional protocol which was developed during the second half of the 1990s and opened to signature in 1998. And it is in force for some 60 or 70 countries because it is not obligatory. So the states that are members of the MPT have to, um, they must sign a safeguards agreement according to model protocol. But the additional protocol is not something that they must uh, uh, sign or ratify. It is optional. Additional protocol, which is a more powerful God bless, document. So Iran's nuclear facilities are being inspected according to the 1970 protocol and the IAEA goes to facilities uh, that are declared by the uh, Iranian authorities. And since Iran did not declare the Natanz facility from 1984 to 2002 until revelations by an opposition group in Washington, uh, then this facility, which was in Natanz area, was not inspected. And the IAEA did not know anything about it. Why? I mean, now it, it has been inspected uh, in a limited fashion because once in 2002 August, um, this uh, opposition group, uh, you know, provided all the information to the international community. The IAEA Director General Mohammed Al Baradei gave an ultimatum to the Iranian authorities and asked from Iran to sign the additional protocol by 31st of uh, October 2003. Yes, Iran did sign the additional protocol, but did not ratify the protocol. And since Iran did not ratify the protocol, the IAEA still conducts, to the extent possible, inspections in Iran, Iranian facilities, according to the 1970 protocol, or the insert 153. Mm -hmm. Well, once a country signs the MPT and ratifies the MPT, it, it becomes a state party to the MPT. And if this is the case, it is obligatory for the state to sign the protocol, the additional protocol, sort of model protocol. Right? This is an obligation. Then you can ask the same question not as what is the motivation for signing the safeguards agreement, but what is the motivation to sign the MPT? Well, that's a whole different issue. And in 1969, 68, 69, when 
the MPT was open to signature, uh, of course, many states were given this uh, deal. Remember this bonus question? Bargain? Yes. What was the answer? Aralp, what was your answer to the bonus question? It was the answer that when the countries signed MPT, they will uh, privilege from taking enrich uranium from the non-nuclear. Sorry, let me put it this way. Uh, put in any, any way you like. <laughs> Uh, not if countries state their clear intentions about not getting non-nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. non weapons, they will get enriched enrich uranium from nuclear Well, not, not only enriched uranium. Yes, Shua? Uh, in the MPT bargaining process, there are two different groups of uh, member states. Uh, but the bargaining uh, essence is the non-nuclear weapon states uh, if you want to join the MPT, they will have to give up their military purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, there is only one uh, condition they get uh, other uh, nuclear power. All right. Other answers? Um, or um, did your answer look like anything like this? Or if it's entirely different? I don't know. <laughs> How was your answer? I don't remember. You don't remember? All right. Enis, remember your answer? Mm -hmm. He promised that uh, by negotiations we try to diminish these facilities in our countries and we use uh, these nuclear uh, capabilities for the peaceful yeah, for the peace. purposes. Well, you seem to a little bit uh, confused. Actually, it's very simple. For foregoing the option, I mean, to giving up the option to build nuclear weapons, you are given this chance to acquire peaceful nuclear technology. So the nuclear weapon states say this. Look, now we have nuclear weapons. We cannot put the genie back in the bottle. We cannot disinvent nuclear weapons. We have invented these weapons. Now we have these weapons. Sorry for you guys. Well, they don't say this way. It's, it's a little bit an arrogant way of saying. But they say, now that we have nuclear weapons, we will do our best to disarm ourselves in the foreseeable future and we will start with goodwill negotiations as to how to do it. But in the meantime, if you promise not to acquire nuclear weapons or not to sort of uh, uh, have the intention to develop nuclear weapons, we will give you peaceful nuclear technology for peaceful purposes. So that was the bargain. So therefore, why should a state, I mean, if nuclear weapons are so important, for prestige, for security, for this or that, because uh, nuclear weapons are found to be significant or important uh, because instead of standing large armies, thousands of tanks, hundreds of thousands of uh, soldiers, maintenance, uh, all this administrative costs and everything, I mean, if you have a couple of nuclear weapons, you might think you might become untouchable. Just look at what or the position of North Korea, for instance. And my students, as well as other people you know, in the conferences, always ask that. This uh, preferential treatment of the West towards North Korea and Iran. And my answer is that North Korea is not a threat to Israel. And that's why Iran is thought to be a threat to Israel well looked uh, at the issue from the U.S. perspective, from the European perspective, and of course from Israeli perspective, and therefore Iran is put on the radar screen. So some countries think or believe having nuclear weapons is a privilege, is a, is a matter of prestige, is a matter of uh, a deterrence, is a matter of you know power. So if this is the case, why would a state forego the option, give up the option of developing the weapons once and for all? Well, from my personal perspective, I hate nuclear weapons, and therefore I'm a man of disarmament. And I explain this on many occasions here. I'm against nuclear weapons, I'm against proliferation, et cetera, et cetera. But why would a state do that if nuclear weapons are associated with prestige, power, deterrence, economic uh, or efficiency, anything? 
because there is, there is this bargain. Countries, especially big in the 1970s, 68, 70, 72, 75, 80s, I mean, nuclear technology was a state-of-the-art technology. Not all states not, uh, could you know, have access to the technology. So, therefore, they thought if we become a state party to the MPT, we will get nuclear technology transferred to us from other countries which have <coughs> nuclear, uh, nuclear capabilities, nuclear technology. And since in our position, we do not need nuclear weapons, if they think so, or we cannot even develop nuclear weapons, or some others might have been more intelligent, quote unquote. Some, some state might have, states might have thought, well, let's enter, let's become a state party to the MPT, let's entertain the privileges, let's acquire technology, let's develop some indigenous capabilities ourselves, let's develop a cadre of scientists, scholars, uh, technicians, experts, and then when the day comes, we can develop breakout capabilities, and we can walk out of the MPT. So other, many states may have had different uh, motivations, different reasons. But what is important here is, once a state becomes a member of the MPT, that is signed and ratifies the MPT, <coughs> according to the terms of the MPT, it has to sign a safeguards agreement with the IAEA within a certain period of time, and this safeguards agreement must be according to the model protocol of 1970, which was a weak document, or weaker document, than compared to the more um, current document, which is additional protocol. But as I said, Iran has, is a state party to the MPT, and the safeguards agreement is signed according to the 1970, the weak model protocol, according to which only uh, the facilities that are declared by Iran can be inspected, and according to this safeguards agreement, there are certain periods. And again, uh, there are some loopholes and shortcomings in the procedures. Iran signed the protocol, addition protocol, after the <coughs> revelations about the Natanz facility in August 2002, but it has not yet, and most possibly will not do so in the foreseeable future, has ratified the addition protocol, and therefore, addition protocol is not in force for Iran. So therefore, it is not possible to have a clear picture of Iran's nuclear capabilities. Inspections in Iran are conducted by the IAEA to the extent that are allowed by the former, weaker, older document. There is a period, as I, as I will talk about in, a, in the next hour probably and in the coming days, <coughs> Uh, there is a period from late 2003, early 2005, Iran acted as if it was a member of the addition protocol, or it had ratified as if it, was, it had ratified the addition protocol, and opened most of its facilities to IA inspections. Still, the, the West was not satisfied because the West feared uh, of the presence of existence of some hidden uh, facilities, and there were some indications of this, as again we will talk about later on. So, therefore, from the West's perspective, or from the perspective of those who are concerned about what Iran's capabilities are, it is not possible to say what exactly the situation is. No one can say Iran's capabilities are at this level or that level, because we don't know. We know to the extent the IAEA was allowed to enter some facilities and visit some of the facilities and some specific places within these facilities. They cannot go <coughs> everywhere. They cannot take samples uh, from water, uh, I don't know, uh, air, soil, whatever. So there are certain uh, uh, differences in perspective, perspectives. Iran says, I'm not doing anything wrong. And my capabilities are fully peaceful. I have no such intentions. And therefore, all these allegations are baseless, unfounded, and are just you know, uh, you know, conspiracy of Israel, which itself is not in the MPT. Well, that's also another fact that we will have to talk about, because MPT uh, is uh, signed and ratified by almost 
uh, all of the countries except for Iran, sorry, Israel, Pakistan, and India, and now uh, North Korea as a withdrawal uh, has withdrawn from the MPT, and now it's a non-member. So they are not bound by the terms of the MPT. Israel, India, and Pakistan, as well as North Korea, are not bound by the obligations uh, or by the terms of the MPT. So this does not mean that they can do whatever they like. Well, in theory, yes, maybe. But everything, international law is not everything, but it's most actually important. But of course, uh, there are certain limitations as well. Ennis? Well, Israel has very little relations with the IAEA because nuclear weapon states uh, have voluntary agreements with the IAEA for their non-military facilities because nuclear weapon states have a number of nuclear reactors or nuclear facilities, not all of which are you know, used for military purposes. There are approximately 100, actually 104, 103 nuclear reactors in the United States. And some of them are used for military purposes, I mean, to, to produce enough plutonium in the waste to be extracted later on. And so therefore, uh, because countries like Germany, which had uh, a number of uh, some 35 or so nuclear reactors. I might be mistaken in terms of numbers. Uh, Japan, 53, 54, or maybe 55 nuclear reactors. And other countries uh, which had nuclear reactors and which had to accept all these inspections and during these inspections, as I said, the nuclear reactor must be stopped, must be shut down for a while, or at least some parts must be shut down. Now there are technologies which you do not have to shut down uh, during the inspections, etc. But they said, look, this is to our dis commercial disadvantage. And therefore, nuclear weapon states, which have nuclear reactors, and which are used fully for peaceful purposes, have voluntarily agreed, even though it was not necessitated by the MPT, have voluntarily agreed with the IAEA to open their uh, facilities for inspections from time to time. But these are not the kind of inspections that you expect from a non-nuclear weapon state because the purpose of inspections, remember this, the purpose of IA inspections is to detect on a timely fashion, I mean timely detection of diversion of significant quantity of fissile material from peaceful to uh, uh, military applications. So the, the at the cracks of the inspections, the purpose is to detect if there is anything that is wrong. I mean, diversion from peaceful to military, something against the bargain. The bargain was, give up the military ambition, I'll give you nuclear technology. That's it. So if you take this technology and st you know, use it for a while for peaceful purposes and then decide to divert from peaceful to military, the IAEA's task is to detect this diversion, but on a timely fashion, not after some time has passed. So we'll continue with this after the break.